I'm going to be talking to you about uh, quite a bit of work we've done over the last year or so trying to understand the genetic basis of autism. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our particular perspective uh, in terms of actually trying to identify the, the genes um, and risk factors associated with it. So just a, a few comments about the disorder itself. Uh, we recognize it, as so do many others, as a neurodevelopmental disorder with impairments in communication, social interaction, as well as repetitive behaviors. The CDC uh, estimates now one out of every, every 68 children is on spectrum. And important for this talk is really the idea that there's significant comorbidity with intellectual disability, epilepsy, and other neuropsychiatric conditions. And then the last point I wanna make with respect to the disorder, and it's something that I think is uh, particularly challenging for us and others, is really the phenotypic variability. So shown to the right are three patients with autism. And uh, I like these examples in part, um, the top girl represents someone who actually has the 1Q21 microduplication. So this is a, a locus that was identified by Heather Mefford in our lab back in the mid 2000s. Uh, the child on the right actually has a mutation, a de novo mutation in a gene called CHD8. And that was a locus that working with Rafe Bernier was identified uh, by our group um, a few years back as well as Mike Dakowski. And then the last child at the bottom is a child with a de novo mutation in ADNP, or activity dependent neuroprotective peptide. And I show these three examples for one very simple reason. 10 years ago, these children would not have had a diagnosis. They would have had a diagnosis of autism, but not a genetic basis of it. And I like these examples because they highlight how far we cut, we've, got, we've come, but we also have a long ways to go. Uh, because in case of more than probably 70% of autism, we still don't have a genetic diagnosis. So these are still the minority with respect to identification of cause. So what about the genetics of autism? Well, it's been recognized for decades that there's a strong genetic component. Um, lower bound estimates at 50, I think most people believe now based on some of the more recent studies out of Sweden and elsewhere that that number is closer to 80%. Another component of the disorder, which we believe is genetically based, um, is the fact that there's a bias for males versus females. So it's well established a four to one male to female bias for this disorder. And as children get higher functioning, the proportion of males rises to six to eight to one. And then over the last decade, there's been tremendous advances, I would argue, in, in, in trying to understand the genetic variants or the classes of genetic variation that are important to this disorder. And I think early on, there was a recognition that large copy number variants, so these are big deletions and duplications, both inherited as well as sporadic events, were responsible for maybe as much as five to 10% of cases. Later, work from uh, Mike Wiggler, our group, and Matt State, uh, among others showed the de novo mutations that disrupt genes. So these are sporadic mutations that aren't in the parents, but that actually disrupt a gene and its function, maybe an upper bound of about 20% of the cases. And then there's been numerous studies uh, by um, Ben Neal and Mark Daly, as among many others, that have shown the importance of common variants particularly with respect to polygenic risk of contributing to maybe all forms of autism at some level. So these are all very different kind of findings over the years, but I, I actually want to remind, it's important to remind myself sometimes as well as my students and postdocs. So I, I think it bears repeating that the reason geneticists are studying autism really is for, to me, very three, three very interrelated reasons, but they're distinct. One is to understand the genetic architecture. This is something that we wanna be able to do, understand the relative contribution of de novo and inherited and CNVs versus other class of variants. The other thing that's incredibly important, and I, and I think it's the part that has drawn me to the study of rare variants, is that we need to understand the genes. It's not significant enough or important enough just to understand the architecture. We need to know the genes that when disrupted result in a child with autism so we can offer the family's insight in terms of diagnostic potential. And then the last, which is probably a Herculean task, which we have only begun to crack, um, 
is really understanding the variability. It's this question that we have children that are born with disruptive mutations. We now know this well from many of the disorders that we've studied, where a child can be severely handicapped on one end of the spectrum or only mildly affected on the other. In fact, there are unaffected parents that have mutations and genes that, you know, you know, 99% of the time we see them as associated with autism, yet the parent is unaffected. So understanding this variability, I think, is absolutely key. It's absolutely key from the perspective of diagnostic, diagnostics, but also for the development of treatments in the future. All right, so my talk today is going to be focused on studying the impact of rare variants. And I would argue that one of the most important findings uh, now, close to you know, almost two decades ago, was discovery of large copy number variants, both deletions and duplications, as being increased in frequency in children with autism compared to their unaffected siblings. So the first studies in developmental delay were by Bert DeVries out of Nijmegen, but then studies on autism from Jonathan Sabat and Mike Wiggler clearly showed that in terms of autism, particularly simplex autism, where there is no family history, there's an excess of those types of events particularly de novo events, events that are sporadic that happened in the production of the sperm and egg that went to make the child. The reason this model was so important, in my opinion, is it emphasized two properties of respect to the genetics of autism. The first was that de novo mutations were incredibly important for high penetrance events or large effect events. So events by themselves that would be sufficient for a to result in a child with autism. The second thing, which I don't think we, we clearly appreciated back then, but has become more apparent, most of the CNVs, and there are a few exceptions, but most of the deletions and duplications are large. They involve multiple genes. And attempts to narrow these down sometimes to an individual gene, and about half the cases has actually failed to identify an individual gene. And that's probably because it's not just one gene that's dosage imbalance, but multiple genes that is contributing to an autistic state. So the importance of de novo and very rare mutations within families and the effects of multiple genes resulting uh, in a child with autism. Another important study uh, that I would argue is a landmark was the work um, um, from Brian O'Rourke, Ivan Iosifov, and um, Stefan Sanders to characterize the Simon simplex, simplex collection by exome sequencing. And so what exome sequencing does is it focuses on that 1% of the genome that encodes proteins. And what we did in this study was essentially analyze all families from the Simon simplex collection at that time, about 2,517 families, and just catalog the de novo mutations that were present in those families. And so what I'm showing you here is what the structure for about 2,000 of these families looked like on the right. These are families where there was no family history of autism, and there was one affected individual in the family with, aut with autism and an unaffected sibling without autism, shown here in green and red. And what we did in this study was very simple. We just essentially tabulated all the new mutations that were found in the child, both for the autism proband as well as the child unaffected in, in, the, in the family, and then compare the relative burden of those types of mutations shown here on the left. So an LGD is your most severe mutation. It's a likely gene disruptive mutation. You can think of these as the gene killers. Synonymous are mutations that are de novo mutations that have no effect on the protein. So that's why they're called synonymous. And in this sense, result in a replacement of one amino acid by another. And so what you, if you look at the mutations which have, what would you predict largely have no effect, there was no difference in the overall number of synonymous mutations in proband versus sibling. If we look at the gene disruptive or the gene killing mutations that were de novo, I think you can see quite clearly here that there was an excess and a significant excess, about a two-fold excess of those gene killing mutations. And while this, may not look very impressive. This difference in terms of missense mutations is also significant. And subsequent studies have shown that essentially there's an excess of de novo missense, i.e. replacing one amino acid with another in a, uh, and an excess in children with autism. Okay. 
So why is this important? Well, this study was important not because it proved any or very few individual genes associated with autism, but it gave us a path. It showed us that de novo mutations, particularly gene killing mutations, would be enriched significantly in children with autism. So if we studied large numbers of children and families in particular with autism, we might have the power to begin to identify individual genes. And so some back of the envelope calculations also suggested that this contribution of these types of mutations may account for as much as 21% of cases. So this is work of Ivan and Mike Wiggler. But recurrent hit genes uh, that were hit were rare in this study. So this brings us to the challenges, what makes autism genetics, I think, so hard. We have this thing we call in genetics called locus heterogeneity, which in simple terms means there's many roads to Rome. So there's many ways you can get a child with autism and any individual gene when mutated could result in a child with autism. And so estimates have, have fluctuated between 300 and 600 individual genes. Each one when mutated could result in principle at least a severe mutation result in a child with autism. So if you have that many individual causes of autism, you need huge sample sizes to prove any individual gene. That's point number one. When we go back to the CNVs, I already mentioned to this before, many of them, most of them that are associated with the disorder are large. And in most cases, the specific gene is not known or in cases where people have tried to drill down it's likely that there's multiple genes underlying that CNVs when you have too much or too little of them actually interferes with development resulting in a child with autism. So if you add all those together, at best you can explain maybe 30% of the cases, some people think half that amount. But then the question is, where's the rest? If really 80% of autism is due to genetics, we have a long ways to go to really identify the other types and classes of mutation. And I want to emphasize that it is critical, in my opinion, to identify the individual genes with confidence uh, that are associated with autism. Why? Number one, diagnostic. Early intervention is key to autism and knowing the genes allows us to identify basically even prenatally in principle if a child is going to be affected or not or have a higher likelihood of being affected. And more important, knowing the genes sheds lights onto the protein pathways, the proteins interact actually during neurodevelopment, and knowing which pathways and which children fall into different pathways in principle would allow us to develop customized treatments to help individual children. So I wanna be clear, if there's any families listening, that we're a long ways from having treatments for specific subtypes, although people are working hard on this particular problem. But the foundation, in my opinion, is making sure we understand the genetic components so at least we can begin to bin children into you know, different subtypes based on that information. So what I'm gonna to do today is talk to you about some of the recent work that we've done, um, mo most of it unpublished, regarding essentially gene identification. And our lab has, along with other labs, has taken three different approaches. One is to sequence more and more families, both by full exome, so that's just when we focus on the protein coding or the entire genome, which we call full genome or whole genome sequencing. The other approach, which we've, we've used quite extensively here at University of Washington, is once we identify a candidate, basically sequence just a subset of those candidates deeply in a larger number of samples, almost like we're using that as a replication of proving the significance of specific mutations in genes. And then the third, which I will not discuss today, is really the intersection of both copy number variants and the sequencing data sets to really pinpoint additional CNVs as well as additional genes associated with the disorder. So I'm gonna to talk to you about this uh, in terms of really our focus on the last, uh, last, I guess, year or so. So one thing I wanna make clear is that our perspective actually from the very beginning when we started to discover CNVs associated with autism was not to make a huge distinction between autism or children with developmental delay. And this is different from many other groups who will basically focus on one or the other. The reason, and many of you know this, is that a lot of children that are diagnosed with developmental delay, estimates as high as, as, as 
actually it will also have a diagnosis of autism. And not all clinical centers make that type of diagnosis, specifically our European colleagues. So what we've been doing, and this is really work of one postdoc in my lab, is we've been trying to gather all the families where, we, where the, a child has been diagnosed with developmental delay or autism and basically characterize the de novo mutations in those families. So based on our analysis uh, to date, we've been able to actually gather data for about 47,000 families, about 16,000 of them with autism, 31,000 of developmental delay. And of those, those families have come in two flavors, those in which we just have a mother, a mother and a father and an affected child. We call those trios. That's the bulk of them, about 41.7 thousand families. And then the others we call quads because there's an affected individual, a mother and a father and one unaffected sibling. So we call those quads versus trios. So these are the data that have been collected. Some of these families have been done by whole genome shotgun sequencing. Some of them have been done by exome sequencing. And what we have done in this analysis is we decided to perform a meta-analysis where we would actually treat autism or individuals with a primary diagnosis of autism separately from individuals with developmental delay and then combine all the data. And I wanna make an important point here. Everything that you see with an asterisk represents samples where we've done the calling independently. So in other words, Different labs, and then over this time period, many different labs have contributed to this. Many of the samples, for example, that I'm going to talk about today were recently published in a paper in Nature last week um, from the DDD, Development Disability uh, Cohort. But what we've been trying to do wherever we could was to reanalyze the same samples using the same pipeline, because it actually turns out to be critically important to making sure we have consistency. So in this case, about half the samples were essentially able to actually redo the analysis from scratch. So this is the pipeline. And this is largely the work of one postdoc in my group, uh, Tin Yun Wang, who's shown here to the right. So the idea is quite straightforward. We have three groups of individuals that were interested in finding de novo mutations. We do de novo mutation discovery. We do extensive QC filtering. They, we then consider basically enrichment by applying three different models. One based on the expectation of how many de novo mutations we would see based on divergence of that gene between a chimp and a human. We call that CH model, first developed by Brian O'Rourke from our lab. Another method, which actually goes further back, developed by Caitlin Samoka called the Novalizer, where we look at uh, the di divergence between macaque to human as well as the context of the mutations where they're found. And then this method developed more recently by the DDD called de novo West, which has the advantage, it's similar to de Novoizer, but has the advantage of identifying uh, mutations that are more likely to be clustered than you expect by chance. So we analyze each of these data sets independently and then combine the ASD and the DD set, which the rest stands for developmental delay, to identify genes with significant excess. And we have two thresholds. We do a 5% FDR as one threshold, that's our least stringent. And then we have what we call family-wise error rate, which corrects for the total number of genes, as well as the total number of tests that we're applying. And so our goal here is to find new genes uh, associated with autism and developmental delay, compare the relative contribution of those genes or de novo mutations in autism versus DD, and then look at the genes that are essentially enriched and specifically for the biological pathways. So I wanna spend a, at least a, a minute or so talking about the importance of quality control. So we apply a lot of different quality controls when we're doing this uh, data because of the different platforms and the different methods that have been used to, apply, to identify de novo mutations in different labs and at different time points. So as I mentioned before, wherever possible, um, we try to apply the same pipeline to the underlying raw data. So i.e. going back and pulling down the raw data. Unfortunately, we can't access all the underlying raw data because it's not released. 
But in the case, for, like I said, for about half of them, we can do that. We make a concerted effort to remove what we call overlapping samples. So some of you probably are well aware that families often participate in more than one study at a time. Uh, and so they're sometimes part of the same collection with different IDs. And the best way to identify them is by kinship. So we use King to identify um, what would be otherwise considered identical twins, but are not. They're just the same samples represented uh, in different studies. We're combining genomes and exome data. And obviously genomes has been shown multiple times have increased sensitivity. And so we have to be wary of regions, particular regions where we have better coverage within the genomes compared to the exomes. And then for those samples that come from cohorts where we can't actually go back and reanalyze the underlying raw data, we've actually excluded variants specifically if, if they are recurrent and they're restricted to a specific cohort. So we have seen examples where individual samples have too many calls or individual sites are called multiple times, but are not actually seen outside of that cohort or that study. So as an example, I wanna show you uh, kind of the importance of comparing, uh, applying the same pipeline. So this is 414 trios um, that were analyzed. So they were analyzed, they were actually samples from the DDD, Development Delay Study. And there are two different pipelines. So the developmental delay or uh, deciphering developmental delay uh, has their own pipeline. It involves using GATK specifically, uh, and it applies essentially a predictor of, of, of pathogenicity of particular variants. And so when they did their analysis, they came up with a, a number of events. We applied our pipeline um, basically to the same data set. Um, and I wanna say that our pipeline differs in the fact that we require two different callers to agree. So there's one called GATK and the other Freebase, we take the intersect. And then we do a, quite a bit of extensive filtering. So we require that the allele frequency be, be above 0.25, that there be no evidence of an event in the parents, that the actual quality is high, that there's at least nine reads supporting the, the site in both the father, mother, and the child. And so when you compare essentially what DD called versus what we called on the exact same 414 trios, the good news is that 75 to 80% of the de novo variants overlap, but there are events that don't overlap. And so you can see here, this little gray, that when you start to break out, you can see that about 52 of the events uh, were basically called only by a single caller. Uh, so the reason that we didn't pick them up is because we required two callers to call them. Uh, 19 events, the child had an allele frequency that was less than 0.25. And in 54, the parents had some evidence of the variant, even though it's, it's, it's rare uh, or a low frequency, suggesting that these represent mosaic events. And others have, have insufficient coverage of, from our analysis. So it's not to say that one call set is better than the other, but it's to, to basically to say that we need to be uniform as much as we can in terms of calling the variants. Otherwise, we're comparing apples and oranges when we do these types of studies. So I'm gonna just jump to the results and I'll take you through this slowly because there's a lot in this table. So on the left is our, our least stringent set of data, genes that reach FDR significance. So it's a false discovery rate of less than 5%. And we've broken down the cohorts based on ASD only, DD only, and then NDD, stands for neurodevelopmental delay. This means we've combined both uh, the DD and the ASD as one cohort. So we treat them as one. So here are the different models to predict essentially pathogenic events, or at least an excess of de novo events. So the CH chimp human model, de novoizer model and the de novo West, which gains particularly clustered de novo missense mutations. And on the right is our most stringent set. So these are genes that reach family-wise error rate significance where we correct for the total number of genes as well as the total number of tests. So you can see those numbers are much lower, but these would be the higher confidence candidate genes that are being identified. So kind of taking two different extremes, 
the least stringent. These are candidate genes. These are based on the combined data sets. There are 650 genes that show an excess of de novo mutations, both missense and loss of function are likely gene disruptive. Based on the union of all three of these callers, which have their own strengths and weaknesses, and combining both ASD and DD at a 5% FDR. The flip side, this is based on essentially the same data set across both ASD and DD, but this is requiring all three of these predictors of pathogenicity to agree. So this is the intersect, 136. So this would be our most confident set of genes uh, for associated with autism and developmental delay. All right, so if we dr drill down a little bit, I'm prepared or continue and prepared some vents to show you how this overlap compares. So remember, this is considering autism as a, basically as a separate group. These are the children that have developmental delay, recognizing there's a lot of kids that have both between these two groups. And then the, the blue represents putting it all together. So this is the, the kind of the distribution of events that you see. So there's value added in obviously combining the data because you get 129 based on the union of the models or 23 genes based on the intersection of the models that you otherwise would have missed. Okay, so these are new genes where we pick them up based on essentially the addition of or combining both the autism and developmental delay cohort. This is the more stringent perspective. This is using family-wise error rate. You still see pickup, in this case, smaller numbers, 30 and 11. But when you look at the individual genes, most of them are genes which we would believe actually are particularly relevant with respect to developmental delay or autism. They're genes in which there are case reports indicated by the asterisk, some that have the number sign that are already associated with specific syndromes, such as FBN1. And interestingly, there are genes uh, that are indicated here with ampersand which have been already implicated in cancer. And this is not a new finding. People have often seen that the genes that we identify associated with early development and autism, neurodevelopmental delay and autism, are also genes that are important later in life and when mutated somatically are associated with cancer. The other thing I want you to get from this, which is actually, I think, important, um, is the relatively small number of quote unquote autism specific genes that we're seeing based on this analysis. So this is represented by the purple here. And you can see there are relatively few genes that are actually found significant only in the autism cohort. And in fact, it's not to say that these are not found in the, in the kids of developmental delay, they just haven't reached significance yet in those studies for the most part. So another way of looking at that is to take all of the genes that we've identified, showing the loss of function or LGD events on the left, and essentially the de novo missense genes that have reached significance either by family-wise error or false discovery rate. And the dashed line basically means that there's essentially, this is the, the, the equivalent number of de novo events. So what I'm plotting here in, these, in this chart is the actual number of cases out of the 31,000 children with developmental delay and intellectual disability versus the actual number of cases out of the 15,840 autism cases. So for those of you working in the field, the usual suspects jump out right away. The most significant genes like ADNP, CHD8, SCN2A, you've all seen before and they come up uh, screaming here. But interestingly enough, if you look at this line, particularly this line where there's zero cases in developmental delay, but only cases in autism, we do see evidence of genes that appear to be enriched where there are more cases of autism, such as, you know, here's a gene like ASH1L or WDFY3, but there are very few cases and most cases are just low samples in which they are exclusive to autism and never seen in a child with developmental disability. Now the flip side is not true, right? So there are cases down here, you can see a solid line of genes that are associated with developmental disability and intellectual disability that are not, have never observed even once in 15,000 cases of autism. So we think this is important 
because we think what this is telling us is that there's incredible power in terms of combining data from children with developmental delay with autism. And we also believe, at least from the perspective of de novo mutations, there's little evidence as of yet of an autism specific de novo mutation in rich gene. So that was approach number one, basically mine all the autism and, uh, and, and genomes that exist from families that are out there. The second approach is one that we've actually directed from our lab by joining forces with basically 18 other research clinical groups across the world who have cases of autism and developmental delay. And so if you go and you talk to investigators from around the world, samples have been collected, tests have been run, and as most of you are well aware, in most cases of autism and development delay, there isn't necessarily a genetic diagnosis. And so these are families in which the DNA has been collected, but essentially there has been no large CNV or event discovered associated with the disorder. And so our approach, and this has been something that we've been doing for the last eight years, is to go back to all of these unsolved quote unquote cases of autism and development delay, the delay and actually target resequence our best candidates from the first part of this study, which are from the exomes and the genomes. And so this is a real huge tour de force. Uh, like I said, 18 different clinical groups and 20,000 families uh, really from around the world. So this is a pretty busy slide and I'll, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. The approach that we're doing here is to take a select number in this case, we recently published this, I think it came out uh, a few weeks ago, target 125 genes using this protocol that was developed in the lab of Jay Shinduri called molecular inversion probes, which just allows us to sequence about 50 genes at a time uh, for about $12 a sample. So that's kind of the important part. You can see sequence large numbers very accurately, probably about 95% of the protein coding sequences resolved and just catalog all the disruptive mutations, either missense or loss of function mutations. And we're particularly interested in the most severe, we call them missense 30, because they're the most se severe mutations, uh, you know, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at about one in of a thousand, they would be expected to occur by chance. And so what we do is we do this in a case control uh, kind of design where we basically are resequencing, cataloging the mutations, and then comparing them to a population control group. This is the exact now known as NOMAD, non-psychiatric group. So these are individuals that do not have not, uh, psychiatric disease. And then we compare them against 45,000 uh, samples. And we're careful when we do this comparison to make sure that we're looking at regions of the genome that are well represented across exome sequencing studies. So for those 125 genes, we do a kind of a classic uh, case control mutation burden analysis. And when we did this analysis, we, we identified 48 genes that are essentially false discovery rate 5% and six that would make the most stringent of cutoffs. However, keep in mind that we have on the other side, essentially an analysis looking for de novo enrichment and so we can take those 48 genes and say how many of them are supported by an excess of de novo mutation events. So one is comparing just mutation type in a case control, and the other is looking for enrichment of de novo. And when we do that, of the 48, basically 40 of them, so the majority of them, are essentially replicated between both a case control as well as a de novo mutation burden analysis. So this is just showing you loss of function mutations here. Uh, so there's the significance as a minus log 10 Q versus severe missense on the Y axis. And you can see again, some of the genes that have been replicated. These are genes in which both severe missense mutations in black and loss of function are shown. We have lots of genes that have reached significance and replicated based on excess of loss of function and a few genes this solute carrier gene and this BRAF gene would show excess in terms of missense. The really cool thing to me is that in addition to kind of replicating that these genes are incredibly important to autism and developmental disability, what we're able to do is essentially double the number of cases, families 
that actually have a mutation. So here, for example, is a gene, HNRMPU. So this is a heterogeneous uh, nuclear RNA binding protein that's expressed in the nucleus that's important for processing pre-messenger RNA. So all the published cases and families are indicated below here with their severe mutations, loss of function in red. And all the new cases that came from screening just this gene in 20,000 cases is represented above the line. So for this gene, and for the clinicians that study this gene and the families that are interested in networking, we've essentially doubled the number of cases. The other interesting thing is you start to see really striking patterns, differences between genes. So HNRMPU gene was a gene that we almost exclusively only found loss of function mutations. But here's a gene, this is a potassium channel gene shown here on the right. And this gene is important for essentially excitatory function in neurons. And you can see this excess of de novo mutations, all of them missense. So we haven't identified, at least in the studies that we've done, we have not identified a loss of function, but in fact, severe missense mutations instead, particularly over the functional domains, in this case, the transmembrane domain, as well as the channel uh, portion of this uh, molecule. Here's an interesting one. This is ZNF238, also called ZBT18. So again, known cases at the bottom, the new case is discovered along the top. And if, it, if we were able to determine it was de novo, it gets the lightning bolt. But you can see here that it's almost got two parts, this gene. It's got at the five prime end or the carboxy or the amino acid terminus, you have pretty much predominantly loss of function mutations. But when you get to the zinc finger portion of this molecule, which is the part that's sought to bind the DNA, you can see that there seems to be this switch to primarily missense mutations. And probably the most extreme example of clustering of mutations is this gene. It's a gene known as CTCF. So for those of you who don't know what CTCF is, it's a, a particularly important uh, repressor and activator of other genes. And the way it's thought to do this is by binding and setting up, or at least insulator elements as part of topological associated domains. So it seems to be a master regulator for many genes in terms of expression. Interestingly, you can see this gene is a zinc finger gene and each of these little green blocks represents a zinc finger motif. But when we look at the pattern of, in this case, both loss of function as well as de novo missense, they, something like 95% of the mutations cluster around DNA binding domain three and around five. And what's particularly interesting about this, this is the part that it seems to be incredibly important for making contact with the DNA. So it's a very non-random distribution of this case of de novo mutations, specifically over the DNA binding domains of CTCF. So you could imagine down the road that if we were starting to think about developing therapies, right, knowing these properties of the mutations and how they're associated with children with autism and development delay may help us to find very specific targeted therapies to really not only identify, be specific for the actual proteins that are produced, but the particular parts of the protein. But the other thing, which actually I think is exciting, is remember of these 20,000 families, that we basically went back to and targeted in, in sequence. We identified 48 genes that reached significance. That corresponded to 537 loss of function, 642 missense mutations in families in which genetic diagnosis, their odyssey had stopped because nothing had been found. So for 6% of the families of those 20,000, so it was about a thousand families, we, we were able to wherever possible where clinicians had had the ability to recontact to share this information in a research setting with the families. So why is this important? Well, the thing that we have worked with uh, with many groups, particularly here at the Autism Center in the University of Washington, is once we can gather a large enough patient, set of patients with the same type of genetic etiology, we can actually identify features that are specific to specific subtypes or specific mutations of autism. So for example, disruptive CHD8 mutations, early on we showed with 
Rafe Bernier, that children with this type of mutation tend to have overgrowth, particularly of the of the of the of the of the brain and the frontal cortex. We also showed that these children actually had severe gastrointestinal dysfunctions, much more than you'd expect for based on a random sampling of children with autism. In the case of the genes like DERK1A or the gene ADNP, DERK1A, we were able to show that these children actually had uh, a very specific facial features, but they also had microcephaly. So their brain didn't grow really to the normal size that you'd expect. And this has been modeled and, and shown to be true with respect to mouse knockouts. In the case of ADNP, this is not, that even though we discovered some of the first mutations, Frank Coy and others were among the first to show that the gene is actually has very characteristic dental morphologies associated with it. And the list goes on and on. So over the last, I guess, four or five years, our group has worked with, you know, largely people from this network, but actually even outside this network to provide additional cases to help further clarify the phenotype genotype relationships of specific forms of autism. This is a recent example and the only one I'll show. This is a gene that we knew very little of uh, before. It's TANK2. Uh, it stands for tetratricopeptide repeat anchoring repeat and coiled coil containing. Almost useless, at least for me, in terms of thinking about what this gene does. Uh, but it was clear from the early studies of targeted resequencing and exome sequencing that individuals with essentially loss of function mutations were enriched in both autism and developmental delay. In addition, many of the children, I would say about half of them are extremely severely affected. And uh, a lot of these children have essentially, in addition to motor developmental issues, have epilepsy and a variable degree of dysmorphology. What is particularly interesting about this disorder, uh, for me at least in part, is that when we look at the families, Instead of this one being completely de novo, in about 25% of the cases, we have actually found that the mutation is transmitted within the family. And we have been able to go back to the parents that are carriers. The carrier parents are mildly affected. And so this begs the question, and I don't have an answer for it, why? Why do we have, in this case, this is a, a mother and her son. Why do we have a mother who is normal functioning with some symptoms such as epilepsy and seizure? and a child that is severely affected. And for the neurobiologists out there, this protein is particularly interesting because it actually interacts with a very famous complex known as PSD95, which is important in controlling the regulation of really a vesicle transport in dendrites. And so the function of dendrites, um, particularly uh, excitatory synapses that are being produced, is dependent upon the release of materials in these vesicles. And this protein seems to be part of the, the machinery that is important for a movement of this uh, in the cell. So this highlights what I think is so useful about all this work. Identifying the genes also sheds light on the neurobiology. Because when we identify the genes, we can ask questions. Are the genes more likely to be interacting with each other you know, at the protein level. So this is the protein-protein interaction or PPI networks. Or are they more likely to be a co-expressed uh, compared to a random set? And the answer to both of these is an unequivocal yes. Study after study has shown this. And what's interesting is you can actually begin to group the genes based on essentially their protein-protein interactions and the modules in which they're part of. So what I'm showing you is some data from a study from last year from our group, which looked at protein-protein interaction and gene expression. So protein-protein interaction lines are shown here in pink and co-expression lines are shown here in green. And the size of the circle represents the relative proportion of cases that we saw looking at children with autism and developmental delay. And so I think what you can see here also, I color the circles based on whether it's predominantly loss of function, predominantly missense, or if it's both. So in the case of module one, these are genes that are so associated with really the function of transcription of other genes, particularly chromatin regulation. And you can see that a large number of cases, that, at least relatively speaking, by the size of the circle here, are actually involved and in, associated with these 
Module two, on the other hand, these are genes that are largely associated with synaptic function. So these are genes that are important in terms such as the, the TANK2 gene would be an example or genes involved in glutamate receptors or functions in terms of the synapse. And you can see here, as indicated by the color, these are all the genes that are significant. But here are other genes which haven't yet reached significance, but where we have either one or more de novo loss of function. So given more time and more samples, we predict that many of these genes will become, and in fact, some of them already are significant with respect to autism and DD. This is a set of genes, which I think is particularly interesting. These are genes that have now reached significance in color uh, that are actually associated with serine threonine kinase pathway signaling within the cell. And then these are ones that are maybe a little bit still early to say, but clearly I think are giving us hints. This is a mitogen activation protein pathway, also known as uh, MAP kinases. And all of the genes, there's only two that reach significance, MAPK3 and MAPK21. Interestingly, we only see missense mutations as indicated by blue, but there are many genes that are now in this pathway um, that actually already have, we've observed one or two or more families with a de novo mutation. Why is this important? This is important because I think when therapies are developed, they're not gonna be developed for individual genes per se, but they're gonna be a, developed for a specific neurobiology pathways and to ameliorate or to improve potential outcomes. So it's gonna matter if your child has a synaptic or pruning gene that's disrupted or a gene involved in chromatin regulation. So in the last part of this talk, I wanna focus on basically moving away from de novo mutations. So this talk is about rare variants, but not all rare variants are de novo mutations. There are other rare variants that are actually inherited within in families. And years ago, when we first started analyzing the Simon Simplex collection, one of the medical students in my group decided not to focus on de novo mutations and instead want to look at inherited mutations that were in these families that were being sequenced by the Simons Foundation. So he looked at loss of function mutations, what I've been calling LGD, shown here in red, and missense, shown here in blue, or in gray, I should say. And he compared essentially the frequency of such mutations in probands, shown in black, versus essentially the unaffected sibling. So of the 25,000 families, about 2,000 of them, we actually had an unaffected sibling versus an affected individual to compare. So when Nick, Nick Crum did this work, uh, he considered essentially things that were lower frequency, minor allele frequency less than 0.2%, 0.15%, and continue to work it down, all the way down to private mutations. And to be absolutely clear what a private mutation is, a private mutation is an event in this group of 2,500 families that was seen only once in one family. So that's what private is. And when Nick did this work, he compared using an odds ratio the abundance of such mutations in the probands versus the unaffected sibling, found no difference at less than 1%, found no difference at less than 0.1%. But when he got to the privates, so these are ones that were specific to the family, these he saw in excess in the children that had autism versus the unaffected. Moreover, if you looked at the genes that were most tolerant to mutation versus least tolerant to mutation, this odds ratio tended to increase as you got to genes that were less tolerant to mutation. So to be clear, we didn't identify any genes, we just identified a pattern in that initial study. So fast forward three years later, postdoc Amy Wilford came to the lab and she was interested in revisiting this problem or this question again with a larger number of samples. So, Everything I had shown you up to date has been largely driven by the discovery of de novo mutations, but she wanted to focus on private mutations. And a way to think about private mutations, they're private to a family, probably because they arose in the last few generations in a grandfather, great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother. And so they're specific to the family because they're very young, but they're still transmitting within the family, okay? So they're, they're de novo, one of my colleagues calls them not de novo, they're de proximal because they didn't arise 
essentially in the generation that you're studying, but they arose relatively recently in the family. And so the idea was to go back to all the data sets that we could, where we had unaffected siblings, and actually go back and revisit this question. So there were two cohorts that we focused on. We did our discovery on essentially what we call the CCDG. And this was taking the Simons collection as well as other cohorts that have been collected uh, from our group as well as others and doing full genome sequencing with them. Okay, so that means sequencing as much as we can, the entire family. And so there were about 3,473 autism families that we, we sequenced with Tom Maniatis and um, Mike Zodi at the New York Genome Center. And these families came in two forms. Simplex means that there's no family history and multiplex means there's multiple affected. And this will become important later on. The replication cohort we worked with was with Pam and Wendy, which, which is the SPARC uh, group. And you, I'm sure you've heard about this, but this is an effort that's ongoing to focus just on the protein coding sequence, so it's whole exome sequencing. And we looked at a data set of about 6,500 families. So that's 27,000 individuals. So the experiment, just to be clear, was to compare the frequency of these ultra rare private mutations and ask a question, is there an excess that are transmitted to the affected compared to the unaffected in these quad families? And then do an official test for transmission disequilibrium. So fairly straightforward from a genetics perspective. So this is our study of the genomes. And to keep in mind, you might say, why are we sequencing genomes when we all we need is the exomes? And the re, part of the reason is that the sensitivity from genomes is, is actually significantly higher than exomes. So you do a better job of getting the protein coding if you do the full, full coding sequence, although you can get much more information on non-coding uh, non potential variants as well. So this is actually showing you essentially that odds ratio again. And this time we're looking at essentially the tolerance to mutation indicated on the bottom here by PLI. So this is probably a loss of function, mutation and tolerance. So the genes least tolerant to loss of function are shown here to the right. And the ones most tolerant are shown here to the left. So when we did this analysis, comparing probands versus unaffected significance, we got a whopping signal where it's about 1.1 to all the way up to about 1.2 odds ratio. So in other words, there's an excess of private loss of function mutations being transmitted to probands compared to the unaffected siblings. And this is showing the confidence intervals around that estimator for just the genomes. This gray bluish line at the bottom shows you the results for synonymous mutation versus missense mutations. And if this number is one, which it is pretty much across the board, you can co conclude based on this, this metric of loss of function intolerance, PLI, we see no signal. We then use the spark to ask whether we replicated. And the answer was yes. We have a replication. And if we combine the results and do an official genetic test of transmission disequilibrium, we get a PLI or a probability of between 1.3 to 4.3, depending upon the PLI bin. But the one thing I want you to see from both of these studies is you can see that the actual signal occurs actually quite early. It's not restricted to the genes that are essentially highest PLI, but we begin to start seeing significance even at the lowest probability of loss of function intolerance. And everything I was showing you up to that point, I mean, with respect to de novo mutations, the vast, vast majority of those genes, uh, they have a very high intolerance to loss of function. So they would be over here on this side. This is telling us there's something different about this type of gene that's being affected. It seems to have a more tolerance to mutation in the probability, uh, probability of a loss of function. So, what if we went back and looked at the genes that have already been implicated in autism? Do we see an excess of those types of inherited mutations in those gene sets? So shown at the bottom is probably the highest sensitivity but lowest specificity gene set from the Safari. So Safari, as you guys know, 
or some of you will know, keeps a list of all genes that are thought to be implicated in autism at some level. And you can see that if we look at this transmission of loss of function, there's a slight increase. It's not statistical significant based on the full 845, but there clearly is a signal there. This is an old data set working with the SPARC consortium group. You could also see that signal present there. But then showing on the top here are three sets of genes that have been defined. And let me explain how they've been defined. This is from Stefan Sanders, one of his earlier papers, which are genes that are identified strictly based on autism, studying autism families. These two from Co, the 253 is a relaxed set and the FWR is the most stringent set of 124 genes. These genes were identified by studying, combining data from both autism and children developmental delay. And I think you can see from these three, two, three, these two or three studies that there is a significant excess of private loss of function mutations in genes that are already implicated in de novo mutations being transmitted. But I should point out this is based on combining all the data from the genomes as well as SPARC. But having said that, if we now go ahead and remove all the genes that we've implicated for de novo mutations, so we take all the genes that have basically been implicated for autism and neurodevelopmental delay out of the equation and ask the question as a function of gene constraint, do we see how much of an effect does that have? It turns out, you can see from here, this is the odds ratio shown here in gray considering all genes and then subtracting out the genes in blue that are implicated in terms of doing excess to novel mutation, that essentially 95% of the mutation burden actually still exists once we exclude the de novo enriched genes, which has two possible explanations. Number one, we're identifying a new class of genetic risk associated with autism. Or number two, all the rest of that 95% is going to be found when we finally identify all the de novo enriched genes in the next five or six years. So both are distinct possibilities but we favor the former based on really the properties that we're seeing for these types of mutations. One more thing I, I wanna point out, which I think is actually particularly interesting. So if we take out all the autism genes that we've identified for the de novo mutation, and this includes development disability genes, and we just recompute the odds ratio for bins of PLI, so this is gene constraint of point greater than 0 0.1, 0 0.5, Nine, you can still see there's a strong signal there, as you'd expect, because most of the burden, only 5% is in those genes. But what I think is particularly important is if you then ask another question, let's look at only those individuals that have two or more private loss of function mutations. So it's a far fewer set of the data, but I think you can see from here that the odds ratios still are in fact more appreciable and more significant, even though we've removed 75% of the families, we are finding the families that actually have two or more hits. What does this mean? It means that likely these mutations by themselves are not necessary and sufficient, but actually having multiple hits from a low penetrant effect gene such as these may be contributing essentially to autism in these families. So we've been talking about this for at least uh, a decade, but this idea of actually multiple hits for private variants, what some people refer to as oligogenic model of autism, we think will be particularly important as the numbers of families increase. The last point here I wanna make is what it, does it matter if we break out the families versus simplex versus multiplex? And so remember, we're looking at private inherited mutations, right? We're not looking at families that essentially, or we're not looking at de novo mutations. And to be clear, we know that lots of families that don't have any family history, there will be inherited mutations that are predisposing. But what I think is interesting and has been replicated by the SPARC group as well, is we see essentially an excess, or we see a more significant signal in families where there's a family history of autism, 
In other words, it makes sense. Private inherited mutations, if they are pathogenic, they will be contributing to a greater number of individuals with autism in those families. So the bad news, and it's, it's actually very sobering news, is that no individual gene that's private actually reaches significance. Okay, so we don't have a single gene that we can say, this is an autism risk gene that's found in autism uh, that's in privately inherited. And the reason is we just have too few occurrences of such events uh, in the data. However, if we take those genes, we actually did a filtering where we said, let's find all the genes where we have one or more private inherited loss of function or likely gene disruptive in probands where we've never observed it in an unaffected sibling. So that eliminates quite a few because obviously if it doesn't have any effect, you might not expect it to be in the unaffected sibling. And when we also exclude no one autism genes, we take all of those genes that we have, there's 165 of them. And remember, none of them reach individual significance as being an autism risk factor. We asked the question, is there an enrichment in terms of protein-protein interaction? And the answer is yes. These genes are more likely to be interconnected with one another. And I think what's more important is we see both the usual suspects in terms of modules and protein-protein interaction networks. So for example, chromatin condensation accessibility. We've seen that over and over again with the de novo mutations. We're seeing this now appear, but now a different set of players, different sets of genes um, that are present. Some of you may recognize this one. This one got me really excited. This has been the E3 ubiquitin protein ligase and proteasome function has been associated with neurodevelopmental delay and autism for decades. And we have quite a few genes that actually picked up, each of them a single occurrence with a few exceptions, which are indicated here in color, where we've seen more than you know, two or three families that have a loss of function mutation. But you can see these set of genes pop up. So in addition to the usual suspects like chromatin and regulation of transcription, there are also new pathways, which I think are really intriguing. So this one, I just wanna highlight intracellular transport. So these are a lot of genes, which I actually knew very little about until they popped up on this, uh, this uh, network. These are genes that are important in terms of actual, uh, basically communication between the Golgi uh, uh, and essentially other organelles within the actual cell itself. They're part of the mechanics of movement of actual vesicles within the cells. And in a recent paper from uh, Dan Geshwind, they also highlighted some similar related genes of intracellular support, uh, intr intracellular transport, I should say, associated with this. So I'm excited by this because I don't think this is by sure, but to be sure, none of these genes here that I'm showing have reached significance yet but there are candidates here that may be incredibly important as we get to the 50,000 families or the 150,000 families that have uh, autism or we haven't been able to identify de novo mutations. And then my final point on this is we asked one more question about these private mutations. How old are they? And so there's a beautiful program called RELATE that was recently published, uh, which tries to estimate the evolutionary age uh, in generations based on coalescent properties of the mutation that you identify. So we took a subset of the genes that we identified that were loss of function that met our criteria, and we measured that, that average age, and the average age of these mutations was about two and a half generations. We then compared it to other loss of function genes that were in the proband, as well as the sibling, as well as synonymous, and the results suggest to us right now, and again, these are relatively small numbers, but the data suggests to us that the mutations that we're seeing, the ones that we're implicating uh, in being transmitted to probands are actually younger, significantly younger than other loss of function mutations, either in the siblings or the probands. So why is this? Well, we think it's because these, even though they're still being transmitted in the family, are being selected against because children with autism are less likely to reproduce. And so as a result, they have a younger age within the family. So they arose in the great grand parental generation, at least based on this estimate. 
So if we put it all together at the end, and this is kind of summarizing um, data from both the de novo mutations, as well as pathogenic CMVs, the private loss of function mutations. And here we're restricting the, these again to the, the highest, the, the PLI bin. And also we looked at a common variation from the PRS or polygenic risk score. What I'm showing you here is the estimated population, population attributable risk by class of genetic variant. And to do this, we did a multiple logistic regression. So there are two values here. Well, all of these values here are significant that I'm showing you. So each class of variant is important in terms of autism, but the relative contribution is very different, both in terms of what we call the effect size or the likelihood or probability that a person that has such a mutation. So for example, a de novo loss of function mutation, uh, particularly in a, in a, a NDD associated gene will increase your risk of autism by 11 fold compared to a pathogenic CMV. You can see these other variants that I discussed, these private inherited increases your risk significantly. But what I think is interesting is the proportion of cases that are exposed, right? So here, the de novo mutations, and these should be considered lower bounds, I would argue, but about 4.39% of the population attributable risk. Pathogenic CMVs, 0.89. The private LGDs that are, that are transmitted, essentially private LGDs and transmitted with, within families to probands are 3.31. And what I, I think is important here is that even though we don't know the genes yet, the data would suggest that this may be on par with its contribution to essentially the de novo or slightly less. So a large fraction of cases, right, may be attributed to essentially private loss of function mutations that are accumulated in children with autism. So I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over this. It was just simply to say that we have signals now that we're detecting from missense private mutations. They haven't reached significance yet, but they're present. Uh, we just need a, de a different classifier other than PLI to identify um, really pathogenic. In this case, we're using a machine learning based approach called MutePred. So these are odds ratios for private inherited missense mutations. And we clearly are seeing a signal. Uh, the fact that these circles aren't closed means that we haven't reached statistical significance yet. But we believe that's another class of variation that will appear as we get more and more cases in families sequenced with autism. So in summary, I just wanna kind of highlight a few higher level um, points. Large CNVs and gene disrupted de novo mutations I think have been incredibly important because they provide a model for discovering genes and particularly rare variants of very large effect. So in terms of identifying new genes from familial sequencing, our strategy has been to combine both autism and developmental delay. Our least stringent set is 615 genes uh, with essentially now we think 136 genes that are most stringent. When we compare autism and developmental delay cohorts, uh, we basically find no genes that are autism specific, at least based on this model at this point. Targeted sequencing I still think is very valuable um, for two reasons. It actually helps prove individual genes in a case control design but maybe more importantly, it allows essentially both researchers, clinicians, and families to network. So by doubling the number of cases, right, that exist from you know, 10 to let's say 30 cases for a specific gene, we then have enough data points to ask the question, is this aspect of the phenotype specific to this form of autism? But more importantly, we help mothers and families to connect to one another almost indirectly because they now have a, a greater pool of other families to, from which to communicate. I think private inherited mutations identify another class of genetic variants. And I think the data to me are extremely compelling on this front. First off, the transmission disequilibrium private LGDs mutations to proband is I think pretty convincing. Um, less likely to occur in simplex more likely to occur in multiplex families. Uh, I think that's particularly important. 
The other feature, which I haven't talked much about, is that these genes are less likely to be constrained. So I think that they're spanning a different type of gene that you expect to see mutated in the general population, but very rarely. Our data suggests these are occurring in genes not yet associated with de novo mutations. But when we look at the pathways that we see that are enriched, we see the usual suspects in addition to new pathways. So I think the conclusion on these is that they're less penetrant and families will require multiple such events. And maybe the other hits will also be different exposures that may be environmental that in fact contributes to this actually manifesting as a severe outcome versus a more mild outcome. So if I was gonna put money on betting for new genes to be identified, I would say it would be in these ultra rare class. And I think as the SPARC and other efforts get to those very large numbers of families, this is the place to look for new risk genes um, and really new genes and new pathways associated with autism. Thank you.